spent at Heritage. She has organized over 150 exhibitions and published two exhibit catalogs. She is in charge of supervising the care and conservation of every object in the museum's collection. Jennifer's undergraduate degree was in anthropology. Her graduate degree was in history and museum studies. Welcome, Jennifer Mann. Okay, who's been to Heritage before? <coughs> Everyone? Okay, I'm going to skip the intro to Heritage then. You've already been there, you know about it. Okay. So, the history of the auto collection at Heritage begins in March of 1964. Mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Lilly, the founders of the museum, visited Smoke Tree Ranch, and you can see an image here of Smoke, this is an old postcard of Smoke Tree Ranch, um, outside of Palm Springs, California. While they were there, an antique auto parade drove past them. Everyone was dressed in historic riding costumes. They just got entranced from the beginning. They talked to the organizers of that parade, Donald and Genevieve Gilmore of Kalamazoo, Michigan, who had already formed their own car museum in Michigan that's still around today called the Gilmore. And he, Mr. Lilly learned about the names of the organizations that were protecting antique automobiles. Before he left California, he went and visited the offices of the Horseless Carriage Club, which were based and are based in Los Angeles, and became a member. So he got their um, publication and the, he noted for sale in that publication was a 1916 simplex crane automobile that was up in the suburbs of Boston. So right as soon as he got home, he went up and visited the owner of the simplex, Frank Gardner, and purchased the car. So between seeing the antique car parade and when he owned his first vehicle, it was something like two weeks. Right? <laughs> Where was Lily living at the time? Here on the Cape. He was there. Yeah. So here we go. First car in the collection. That just between March and December, he purchased seven additional cars. And then in 1965, he bought 11 cars, including five just in April. And the following year, he bought, I don't know, another 11 cars, something like that. So once he got into it, he really, really got into it. So and th th those two pictures. Yep. One was the way he purchased it, and the one was restored? Or? Yes. Okay. So he, this is a picture of the car shortly before he purchased it. Okay. So in the early 60s. And then this, it, he changed the color. It was maroon. <laughs> and he decided he didn't like maroon, so he changed it to white and had it repainted. <laughs> yeah. So he expanded his collection as quickly as his funds and garage space would allow it to uh, expand. So he filled up the garages at his property. They got full. He rented a um, storage facility where C.H. Newton Builders is right down in Falmouth. If you drive behind there, there's a garage back there. He filled that with cars. Uh, so he re they enjoyed using them. Um, he found cars by checking ads in publications, the New York Times, whatever. Once he had bought a few cars, people started reaching out to him and finding him and saying, don't you want to buy my this car, this car, this car? When a new car came in, he would pile all the kids in the car and they would drive around the neighborhoods um, in the evenings. He bought first cars that were either already restored or could be restored, but very quickly he found out that sometimes restoration costs were as much as the purchase price or even more than the purchase price. So he started looking for cars that had already been restored. People had already done the hard work and he could buy it already done. When his collection got to 30 cars, he started an upgrading program, so he sold some of the cars he bought previously and then bought better ones. Uh, so here, this is Mr. and Mrs. Lilly in our 1915 Stutz Bearcat. This was a, um, a photo for their Christmas card in 1964, uh -huh. so the year he started collecting. This is also Mr. Lilly in the Stutz. 
in his garage at his house. He was hosting a car club, so I don't know if you can see all these people so standing how around. Would, would you have been in a support? Uh, he would have been at 54. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then this is Mr. and Mrs. Lillian Furcoat standing next to the 1922 Rolls Royce that they bought. So once he had all these cars, he and Mrs. Lilly talked about starting an auto museum. But, and they went all around the country looking at auto museums, uh, but decided that an auto museum on its own would not be economically feasible, viable, long term. Two years after he started collecting cars, his father died, and his father had been a huge collector of coins and books and firearms and military miniatures and art and all different kinds of things. So Mr. and Mrs. Lilly could expand their concept of a museum from just being an auto museum to being a wider museum with more topics, and they started looking around for property. They bought the Dexter Estate where Heritage is currently located in January 1967. And then the question is, what is the auto museum going to look like? So he and the architect arrived at the meeting where they were going to talk about the design of the auto museum with the same book marked to the same page, which was Eric Sloan's A Book of Barnes. And they had the page marked for the round stone barn um, that is at the Shaker Museum right now in Pittsfield, Mass. Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, great yeah. minds think that I didn't have a lot of negotiating. Right. <laughs> yes. So you've all been there. You recognize yeah. the inside of our building. Um, Merton Stewart Barris, who was the architect for this building, was well known for uh, replicating historic structures. Most, and he had three barns full of salvaged lumber from antique buildings in New England. And most of the lumber timber used here is sal from salvaged, other salvaged buildings in New England. So, between 1967, so they moved really fast. They opened, the, between purchase and opening was two and a half years. And they needed to design all the buildings, build all the buildings, do all, design all the exhibits, install all of the exhibits. Really, they were moving incredibly quickly. How many museums, Jennifer, started? Was it the History Museum and the Auto Museum? So when they opened in 69, it was the Auto Museum, the Windmill, the building, now we call our Special Exhibitions Gallery, but at the time was the Military Museum. So our Mr. Lilly purchased from his father's estate his collection of firearms and military miniatures. So that was the original installations in the military museum. And then the immediate feedback was, there is not enough in this museum to interest women. Because it was basically cars and guns. <laughs> and the step outside. Um, so they immediately started planning for the art museum, which opened in 1972. They already had the carousel. But I think in that quick time turnaround, they did not have time to restore all the horses on the carousel, find a platform for them to go on, and get that installed as well. So it was kind of good, because then they could use it as the centerpiece for the art museum mm -hmm. later. And during that time, had they started the landscaping with all the rhododendrons, importing the rhododendrons? Well, the rhododendrons were already there, because okay. Charles Dexter, who propagated all those rhododendrons, lived on that property in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. So he's the one who did all the rhododendron propagating. They did hire a landscape architect in that time period to just sort of work on landscaping and get everything in ship shape. And they definitely added new, new plants at that time. Later, almost but, Right, yes, but the rhododendrons were already there. Okay. Yeah. So, some of the cars in our collection. This is our oldest vehicle, it's 1899 Winton Motor Carriage. When you look at it, you can see why early automobiles were called horseless carriages. They look, it looks exactly like a horse-drawn carriage. The engine is here in the back with like humongous uh, auto parts. This is a one-cylinder chain-drive uh, vehicle. Alexander Witten, the man who made this, was probably the most important early American maker of automobiles. He started, as a lot of automobile makers did, first as bicycle manufacturers, and then moved his way to autos. He introduced his first motor, what he called a motor wagon, in 1896, was the first manufacturer to sell a car to the general public in 1897. 
and Winton was the first car to go coast to coast in 1903. This car is one of 100 that he produced in 1899. That was considered, a remar at that time, a remarkable example of mass production of automobiles. Mm -hmm. Today that's nothing, at that point that was an incredible achievement. The year before that, in 1898, he built and sold 22 cars. One of them he sold to James Ward Packard, who hated it, and wrote, went and told him everything that was wrong with his car, and went and wrote it back and said, if you can build a better car, I suggest you do so. So he did for Packard Motor Company. And now you've probably heard of Packard's, but maybe not heard of Winton's, and so you can figure out that who kind of won that race. Um, do you know what number this one is? One. I don't know. I don't know. So, look at the bottom there. <laughs> Um, the price of this new in 1899 was $1,500. So if you convert that to, I have it converted to $2,019, in this case it's $45,000. Hmm. All right, our next so car, I want to, yeah. yes. The yes. The steering, is it like a carriage where the whole axle rotates, or is it like a car where the two wheels rotate independently? It, mm, I'm not sure how to answer that. It's tiller steering? Yeah. Does that help? Well, so on a, a carriage, right. the axle turns, so one wheel moves forward. It's just it's the back, tires. The, just the so much a car. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that was a big, right about that time, that was a big transition. Yeah. Right. I can see what you're saying. So the next car I wanted to talk about is our 1909 white steam car, Model M. This, so once the museum opened in 1969, Mr. Lilly was like, forget it, I'm not buying any more cars, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> he, he had done it, he enjoyed it, but the process of getting the cars restored and finding all the parts and the correspondence back and forth, he was just finished with that, right? Until the late summer of 1971, he got a uh, letter from George Waterman, Jr. of Providence, who was also a car collector and said, I have two cars I'd like to offer you. One was the wind we just saw, and one was this white steamer. And the correspondence goes back and forth, and finally Mr. Lilly says, I give up, I can't resist. I really want these cars. So I'm going to buy them. So uh, this car was purchased brand new for the White House by President William Howard Taft in March of 1909. He had just been inaugurated, and Taft was the first president to be officially transported by automobile rather than by horse and carriage. He was a big believer in the future of autos, and he wanted to prove that by turning the White House stables into garages instead. He ordered two, he ordered two, four cars. Let me make sure I get this right. Two Pierceros, which were gasoline cars, a Baker electric car, and this steam-powered car. So he was going the whole range, all three choices. So he loved this car. It was made in Ohio. He was from Ohio. Uh, he liked to have his chauffeur, if the press was getting too pesky, he would have his chauffeur release a big burst of steam. <laughs> So we got permission from the White House to paint the presidential seal as it would have appeared in 1909 on the side of the car. And it was there before the car was restored, but needed to be removed during the restoration process. And then in 2016, this car was the ninth car elected to the National Register of Historic Vehicles. So as part of that process, it went to, um, Washington, D.C., and you can barely see the Capitol building, Rotunda, up here. So it was displayed on the National Mall, and they essentially had a gigantic exhibit case for it to go in, and it was there for a week or 10 days or so. So that was really a fun experience for us. So the price of this car new in 1909 was $4,000. So today that's $111,000. Now both of these cars were made in 1910, and I love to put them next to each other because they are so different, right? And they're different because of who the intended customer was for these vehicles. This is a 1910 Sears Motors um, wagon, or Motor Surrey, and a 1910 Cadillac. 
on the bottom. So up here, this is a Sears and Robot Company. This is a car you order from the catalog, mm -hmm. and it arrives in several crates to the railroad station closest to you. You assemble, do the final assembly. It came with oil, but not with gasoline. You provide that yourself, and then hopefully you drive away in it that day. So it's meant for rural customers who have poor road conditions. So the car needs to be much higher so you can avoid all of the ruts and stumps and an improved road had most of the stumps removed. Not all of them, but most of them. So you could need it to be up high and had solid tires rather than inflated tires so you didn't have to worry about punctures. Um, it was easy to repair, chain drive, car, affordable, designed to look familiar. This looks like a horse-drawn carriage that all those rural people would have been familiar with. It has tiller steering as well, like the Winton did. The 1910 Cadillac is super expensive, made for wealthy clientele that are urban slash suburban, so they have better road conditions to drive on. Uh, you would definitely have a chauffeur if you had this car, not that you wouldn't drive it yourself, but the chauffeur takes care of all the complicated maintenance and changing the tires and all of that stuff that you might not feel like doing. Um, lots of brass trim on here, an acetylene tank to run the um, headlights, an actual steering wheel, mm. um, much, much different depending on who the customer was. So the Sears cost $445, which would be about $12,000 today. The Cadillac cost $1,795, including the top, which would be about $48,000 today. Still not up. One of the things I was fascinated by when we were there last week was yeah. the price difference. Mm -hmm. You know, from then to now. Mm -hmm. So that Cadillac wasn't really one of the higher comparative prices. I mean, there were several there that would now be 100000 plus. <laughs> right. Usually those cars are a little bit later in time. So the 20s and 30s. We'll get to some of those in this. Yeah. So this is also a 1910 car, or 1910 Knox, which is how it looks today, which has a really, really great story behind it. Um, this car belonged to Frank Gardner, whose name is familiar because he also owned the simplex that Mr. Lilly bought, his very first car. But Frank, when he was something like 10, 11, 12 years old, first saw this 1910 Knox, and his grandmother, who lived in Maine, her neighbor was a farmer, Mr. Johnson, owned this car. And Frank saw it and loved it. Uh, Mr. Johnson used it around the farm to pull things and whatever. <laughs> when Frank got older and he was a teenager, he wanted to, but he agreed with Mr. Johnson he would borrow the car and take it to some antique car meets. So Frank lived in Boston, the car was in Maine. So he, when he was 18 and took his friend with him who was 17, got to Maine and they drove the car from Maine, and the, the goal is to get it to his other grandmother's house in Truro, who has a barn, and Frank spent the summers out on the Cape, and that's where he wanted the car. They showed up, and it starts just fine, but the tires were in terrible shape, and if they drove any more than like 17 miles an hour, they started to fall apart, and they had to get and just keep stopping and taking the tires on the car and they couldn't get the right size tires because they weren't available then. It took them two days to get from Maine to Boston and they spent the night and then luckily the next day was kind of cool and rainy so the tires didn't heat up as much and they could make the trip from Boston to Truro in one day. So this is them when they arrive in Truro and you, I don't know if you can see that the tires are all taped up. And this is Frank, who's starting it, and all his friends here in the back. And what I want to point out in particular is this young woman here, who he would later marry. She's uh, 15 years old, I think, in this picture, and he's 18. So this is in the late 30s. So you know what happens next, World War II. So Frank serves in the war, comes back, marries Eloise. They, he's still just borrowing the car from Mr. Johnson. He doesn't own it. 
finally talks Mr. Johnson into letting him buy the car for $200, and then he's going to restore the car, and then Frank got polio, and ended up paralyzed from the waist down. So that obviously took time. He finally got around to getting the car restored. He had it outfitted with hand controls so he could drive it. He went out on its first drive, and on the dash, this is a right-hand drive car, and on the dash on your left-hand side is an auxiliary gas tank. Over here to your right are the two spare tires, the um, gear shift, the everything. So there's obstacles on here, okay? Fire starts in the engine. It travels up to that auxiliary gas tank. So Frank is essentially trapped, paralyzed in this car, and he can't get out this way because all the spare tires and stuff are over there. But the fire's here, so he, thank goodness he had friends with him who hauled him out over all of that stuff. And he got out of the car, and he just had a burnt elbow, left elbow. But this is a picture of what the car looked like after the fire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Keep in mind, it was completely restored, and this was its first time out. Wow. So he completely restored it again for the second time. But he never, with the hand controls, he never felt like he could adequately control the car. So at that point, Mr. Lilly had already bought the Simplex from him. So he called Mr. Lilly and said, would you also like to buy the Knox? Mm -hmm. And he did. So the Knox would be, mm, now we're getting up there, $88,000 mm -hmm. in today's dollars to buy. So those cars, were they solid, I guess? No, they were inflated. So we would take? They somehow, I wish I had, I don't, I didn't write down the specific details, yeah. but the tape can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, they did, definitely did not have the right size replacements mm. that were not available. So, all right, our next car here to talk about is the 1912 Mercer That's race about. Is this your favorite? Okay, everyone has a different favorite. All right, so yours is the Mercer Good Choice. Good Choice. So considered the most prized early American racing car. It was known at the time for its advanced design. It had good handling at high speed. It won five out of the six races it entered in 1911 when they first came out. It came with the guarantee that they could, each race about would achieve a minimum of 70 miles per hour with mo without modification on public roads. That's when the time, you know, cars at that point had a hard time going 40 or 50. Uh, this car, we believe, was owned, was, well, at least raced by uh, Barney Oldfield, who was a very well known early race car driver. There are modifications to the engine on this car, but it comes with that history. Modifications to the engine that are consistent with it being used for high-speed racing, also some damage to the car that was um, in the oil pan in particular that would be consistent with high-speed racing. Um, so this photo shows the car as it was when it was delivered to Ken Purdy, who you can see here. Ken purchased it. Ken was an automobile historian and author. He published an article about Mercer's in a magazine, and a man in Canada saw that magazine and said, why a Mercer? And they're so rare. Ken was like, really? <laughs> anyway, they negotiated a purchase price. The guy in Canada got it in a freight car on the train, and it got delivered to Connecticut, where Ken Purdy lived. This is what it looked like at that point. And then Ken had it restored. At that, and so this is Ken's wife here. I mean, he's crank starting it. That would have been in the 40s, sometime. And Ken Purdy's grandsons just came to the Gearhead Garage event that we did at Heritage a few weeks ago because we had the Mercer mm -hmm. out in the parking lot and we're starting it, and um, so that was really fun. Yeah. This is our 1924 Brewster. This car is the car that's received the least amount of restoration of any of our any cars in the collection. Can't tell here, but it has leather fenders on it. Brewster for, was famous for making horse-drawn carriages as early as 1910. Very, very high-end for extremely wealthy clients. 
They made their first auto body in 1896, and then they continued building bodies for other manufacturers, other auto manufacturers. So you could buy a simplex, say. A simplex only came as the chassis, so you're buying the frame and the engine, but they did not offer bodies. You had to go someplace else to get the body made, and Brewster was a bodybuilder for other automobile manufacturers. So they did that until World War II, I'm sorry, World War I. During World War I, their supply of chassis from Europe was interrupted, so they just moved into making a complete automobile during World War I. So they were considered a very good choice for city driving. They were quiet. Um, this, this is definitely super high end. You definitely have a chauffeur if you own this car. Um, they call it the pneumonia special because the owners are completely enclosed back here, but this, the chauffeur's place, the driver's place, is open. There's a speaking tube in here. There is a light right here on the side. Um, oh, I forget what they call it. It's something like called an opera light. So when you drive up to the opera and you get dropped off, and then you're, the opera's over and you're ready to be picked up, you can say to the folks working, you know, my car is the one with the red and green opera light. They can get your chauffeur to come. They know which car is yours. Get your car to come and pick you up. And it's, again, hard to see here, but this on the side here looks like applied caning mm -hmm. to the car, but it's actually hand-painted. And it is mm -hmm. remarkably precise. You can't even believe it. Mm -hmm. um, this car would be $115,000. Today. Where did it come from, Jim? As far as where was it made or where did he buy it? Yeah. Um, he bought it from, well, this is going to test my memory, um, a woman in Torrington, Connecticut had, had ordered it new. Really? And the New York Public Library has all the records from Brewster. So we just actually, we thought this was a 1916 vehicle until earlier this year when. Um, somebody, a man from England, who knows everything about Brewster's, inquired and asked for the body number and the engine number and this and that and this and that. And we gave it to him and he said, actually this is the beginning of last year, and he said those numbers don't match. They should, those numbers should not be in the same car. Something's wrong. So earlier this year we tore, tore the whole car apart looking for the body number. And we found it, and our records had the wrong body number. I didn't, when I gave the body number, I looked at our paper records. I didn't look at the car. Once we tore it all apart, we found the body number. It was wrong in our records. We sent it to this guy, and he's like, oh, well, that was such and such a car ordered in 1924 by Mrs. Whatever in Torrington, Connecticut. So I did a little research on her and found out her story. And it's unusual for a woman to order a car, so I thought she must be a widow. She was a widow. And then um, it stayed at her house for a long time in the garage and then belonged to her daughter. I don't know that the daughter ever drove it, but then eventually got to Mr. Lilly. Hmm. So, so he's really the second home? Yeah, I think. Yeah. So really, you know, really fun and interesting. Could, could and this you? is the car in a parade in Connecticut in the 1960s. Could I ask you a question about a previous car that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. The Baker Electric. Mm -hmm. What was the power source? Was it rechargeable? Was it a, ba a battery that had to be replaced? In the, I don't, the Baker Electric that Taft ordered for the White House is not a car that we own. We only own the white steamer. We do have a 1917 Milburn electric. At that point, the batteries were rechargeable. I can't speak to the Baker. I don't have. I don't okay. really know about that one. But for our electric car, that's a Milburn. Mm -hmm. I forget how many batteries it had. There were quite a few, but they were rechargeable. Yeah. Okay. Now this is my favorite car. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's another favorite. Yes. <laughs> this is our 1927 LaSalle. Sport painted, yes. So in 1924, DuPont developed a fast-drying automotive body paint. LaSalle was the first car to really take advantage of this new paint. 
in, in their styling. So if you bought a LaSalle, you could choose from 482 color combinations of two or three tone color schemes. Kind of overwhelming. Right, a little overwhelming. Right, and based on, and so when they introduced the LaSalle, it was incredibly successful, and based on its success, um, General Motors started the art and color section design for automobiles. Um, and put Harley Earl in charge. So something I like especially about this car is a two-tone red. This is darker than this on the back. Um, this, it's a dual cowl style. So the cowl is this section that's just in front of the windshield, and it's hard to see, but there is another one back here. They only made 10 of them in 1927, and there are three that are remaining today, including this one. Mm -hmm. I really like this rear cowl because if you, you have to lift it up to get in and out of the car, and when you lift it up, there's the mirror mm -hmm. under there. So, and you could imagine that your hair might be in disarray if you were riding back there. Mm -hmm. So this car has won two prestigious awards from the Classic Car Club of America. It won its national first prize first prize award in 1967. Mr. Lilly bought it after that, and then it entered the museum collection. In 2012, it won the next highest award, which is the senior badge. There has not been another car that's gone that length of time, 45 years, in between receiving those two awards, which I think speaks for the care it's gotten at the museum, and it's been in climate control all of that time. <coughs> Most cars do not get to spend all of their lives in climate control. This one has. Okay, our 1930 Duesenberg. This is a lot of people's favorite. Oh, I forgot to tell you how much the list out cost. Uh, 43000 in today's dollars. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's cheap. Affordable. Wow. Save for such a good looking car. Come on. All right, 1930 Duesenberg, Model J, Durham Tourister. Duesenbergs are the most coveted, the most costly of American-made <laughs> automobiles. Probably the finest cars ever made in the U.S. <laughs> right, exactly. The firm was founded in 1913 by brothers Fred and August Duesenberg. It first as an engine manufacturer and a race car manufacturer. They eventually um, centered their operation in Indianapolis and started making regular, not racing cars, but other cars as well. The Duesenbergs were <coughs> great engineers, but they were neither good businessmen nor administrators. So they struggled with production, they struggled with costs, getting enough capital to keep the business going. So eventually they were purchased by E.L. Cord, bought the company in 1926. And after that, Cord challenged uh, Fred Duesenberg to just sort of let him loose and said, design the best car in the world, let me know when it's done. Um, and so he designed the Model J. Great engineering, great styling, um, inspired to say it's a doozy. It's based on Duesenberg's. This car is restored to its original colors. So it's primrose yellow and parkway green were the names of the colors, just as it, it, so it looks like it did when Gary Cooper, the Western actor, purchased it um, in 1930. He owned the car for at least five years. He raced it. He had it fitted with a custom tourister style body by the coach builder Durham, like Brewster had been a coach builder for other manufacturers, and Durham was a coach builder for Duesenberg. Uh, it has high-end unusual features like an altimeter and service warning lights. So unusual for 1930. This car, we don't know exactly how much it cost new estimated. It was $14,000, which today would be $211,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of people love this car. This is our 1913 mm -hmm. Auburn Boattail Speedster. So Auburn was founded in 1900, was very successful early on, but during, during the 20s, there was a lot of increased competition with automobile manufacturers. And near failure, the company was rescued by E.L. Ford, again, 
Um, so he changed the production to offer great looking cars with fancy features while keeping prices. The quality was not super high, so he could keep the prices down. And that really allowed Ford to build the financial base to acquire Duesenberg, which he did later, acquire Lycoming Engine, and then to start his own car company later. So this is a bow tail. You could see that in the back here, styling. And if you see this from above, sometimes we put it in the center circle so you can look over. This paint scheme, just it looks like it's so beautiful from the beginning, as you're, uh, from above, as you're looking at this all the way back to the bow tail. Almost looks like a canoe, kind of, from, from, above, from above. It was based on um, speedboat styling at that time, very Art Deco and sort of sales room bait so you could get people into the Auburn showroom by having a sporty car like this. Mm -hmm. But this is a two-seater. This is not a practical automobile, especially if you have a family. So you might lure people in and then get them to buy a, a more practical Auburn. So very reasonably priced, this would cost $18,000 today. It was $975 at the time. Mm -hmm. A bargain, exactly. And then Accord. Once E.L. Accord had started, you know, acquired Auburn and acquired Duesenberg, then he had the financial resources he needed to form his own car company. So this is a 1936 Accord Westchester. The Accords are really considered the most striking and innovative car of its time period. Mechanically, it was way, 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 way ahead of its peers. It had front wheel drive, which was unusual. It eliminated the rear drive train entirely, which allowed the car to be so low it didn't need running boards. All other cars at this point had running boards. It featured an alligator style hood, so that's the way hoods open today on all of our cars. Most cars at that time were opening from the side. Um, it has what they call a coffin nose, uh, front end styling, concealed door hinges, teardrop shaped fenders, disappearing headlights. Each one of these headlights are, you have to, if you're, they're hand cranked. So if you're driving a car, you need to lean over and crank up the headlight on this side <laughs> and crank it up on this side. It's yeah. no different than my husband's truck where you have to lean over to get the window. <laughs> so features on this car were way ahead of what other cars were offering at the time period. It really was created a sensation at the time, but the problems were it had so many new features that had not been adequately tested in advance. It really got the reputation for being a very stylish car, but very unreliable. So it was too far ahead of its time, essentially, and wasn't um, too successful. Um, Mr. Lilly had purchased a cord for the collection, a 1937 cord that was yellow. Um, he was not happy with it from the beginning. It had a cracked engine block, the body restoration was bad, and he complained to the person he bought it from, he tried to get his money back. That didn't work. So we, I am not exaggerating to you when I say we talked about deaccessioning that car for 20 years before we finally did it. Mm -hmm. And so that means we sold it, we removed it from the collection, that gets approved by a number of different committees, including our board of trustees. We sold it with the money designated to purchase another cord, and this was the one. We looked at three cords, there aren't that many of them out there, uh, but we looked at three before we settled on purchasing this one. It was a Citroën buddy of mine in Michigan. Hmm? Citroën buddy of mine in Michigan owned that. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, nice. So let's see, cost to buy would be about $43,000. <coughs> and then our 1962 Corvette. <laughs> so the Corvettes were based on a 1952 show car that went in production basically unchanged. So auto manufacturers design cars for car shows. They re reveal them. Everybody's very impressed by everything that these car dealers can do. But very few of those show cars are actually released to the general public, at least at this point. At this, the Corvette did, though, get, go into production virtually unchanged in 1953. 
It was designed, the body was designed by Harley Earl, who had designed the LaSalle, in the, we saw earlier. Um, and it was created as an economical sports car for young adults. When it was released, the, the reaction to it was strong. People liked it, but people didn't buy it. And that was the problem. So they were almost discontinued making the Corvette in 1955, but then Ford came out with the Thunderbird, which forced Chevrolet to keep making the Corvette so they could compete. Eventually, of course, they made a lot of improvements to the Corvette, and the Corvette became very successful and turned into our legendary two-seat sports car today. Um, this one you'll see has Massachusetts antique plate number one. That was a gift to Mr. Lilly from the state uh, in honor of Mr. Lilly purchasing the white steamer, the 1909 presidential white steamer. And we have been sure to renew that <laughs> carefully all the years. And we've received cash offers for it as well. Um, so cost to buy this car would be about $34,000. And this was a gift to the collection, not one that was originally purchased by Mr. Lilly. Okay, speaking of other cars not originally purchased by Mr. Lilly, this is a 1965 Ford Country Squire station wagon. We bought this in January of 2020. Um, when we have been talking about, let's back up, when the museum first opened in 1969, and then in subsequent years, people could remember when they came into the auto museum, people could remember the cars that were on display. And they could say, oh, my grandfather had one of those, or I remember this, or I remember that. Fast forward 50 years, and now those people are not with us anymore, and fewer and fewer people can have any personal memories with the cars that we have in the collection. So we were thinking, what do we, what do we want to add? Cars from the 19, we have a list, but cars from the 1960s were on the list, and there's sort of two car stories happening in the 1960s. The sports car story, and between uh, Thunderbird and uh, Corvette, and we have a Corvette already, and the other story is like family mover, suburbs, vehicles, like the station wagon. One of the other cars we're looking for is the 1950s, something with big fins and chrome, and mm -hmm. you know, we went to a place in Hyannis to look at a 1959 Lincoln, in December of 2019, and th that car was not for us. It just wasn't the right choice. And the owner said, what else are you looking for? And we said, 1960s station wagon. And he said, oh, well, we have one of those back here in this building. Let's go look at it. Mm -hmm. So it was covered, but I have to say I loved it even before the cover came on. Mm -hmm. And then he took the cover off. It was like, yes, this is what we're talking about. So station wagons were neither well cared for nor considered worth saving. So this one is really special. It has its original uh, tropical turquoise paint mm. and color matching interior. Mm. 43,000 original miles on it. This is the top of the line model. So it came standard with cruise automatic, automatic transmission, factory installed air conditioning, uh, fancy upholstery on the seats, Obviously, our simulated walnut wood grain, uh, gabardine finish headliner, sun visors, it came in four engine sizes. This is the largest size, 390 um, V8. But most importantly, people walk in the museum and say, oh, I remember that. I remember riding in the back of that with my brother. I remember, I remember. I remember. So that's what we're, we're going for in this car. And it is definitely working. Healthy dose of nostalgia here. Yes. Jennifer, is, is there any talk about trying to get like a 58 or 59 Imperial convertible with those spaceship lights on the back? That would be awesome. We have we have not settled on a make and model for the 1950s vehicle. I mean, we have some we'd like to buy, but they are unaffordable to us. So, we have to wait and see what well, we have to <laughs> no, Yes. No. No, but, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're fascinating. Right. With these, with the headlights, yeah. they kind of were scooped out and just were right. like yep. balls off. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that would be great. We would love that. All right. And then, 
This car is not yet in our collection, but, but will soon be mm -hmm. in our collection. This okay. is a real wood woody as opposed yeah. to a fake wood woody, which yeah. we just looked at. This is a 1946 Mercury woody wagon that will be a gift to us from the New Hampshire Historical mm -hmm. Society. Oh. Um, they were given the car by one of their trustees, but uh, they find that they don't have room for it. They can't store it at their facility. They can't use it, essentially. Mm -hmm. So they talked to us about buying a car, and I declined three times, and the price kept dropping, 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 and then they called and said, would you take it for free? <laughs> oh, now we're talking. Yeah, now we're talking. We'll take it for free. Yeah. So um, this, it was purchased. It, this is a one-owner vehicle. Um, purchased for Stanley Hamill, new, when he was a student at Harvard in 1946. His father wanted him to come home on the weekends, and Stanley said, I can't possibly do that because I don't have a car. <laughs> so his dad bought him a car, but it's 1946, so you know there's still a lot of production difficulties after World War II, um, so it was long delayed, but finally arrived, and then Stanley's dad and brother delivered it to him at Harvard as a surprise. Mm -hmm. And then he owned it his whole life um, until he gave it to New Hampshire Historical. So mm -hmm. Heritage focuses on items, the culture, work, life, and leisure of people in southeastern New England. So it's great when we can get a car that has a history of spending its whole life in southeastern New England. And we've talked about getting a real wood woody for years because they were so extensively used on the Cape, mm -hmm. uh, both on the beach but also as literal station wagons, like show up, owned by a hotel, show up at the railroad station to pick up and rip the hotel customers and drive them back to the hotel. So we're really looking forward to receiving that. Uh, so as the museum expand, opened in 1969 with 34 vehicles and then gradually with gifts there were more and more cars in that same space and we were finding that the exhibits were too, it was everything was just too crowded. Mm -hmm. So, after fundraising and planning, we added an addition to the Auto Museum in 2010, and part the lower level of that addition includes designated automobile storage space. So we were able to add four lifts that you can see here in mm -hmm. part of that space, so we can store cars underneath there. So. Figuring out, once I figure out which cars I'm going to put on exhibit, then I know which cars need to go in storage. And then it's a very um, challenging math puzzle to figure out how we're going to store them. Because if you put a super tall car on the lift, then nothing will fit underneath. The cars on the lifts have to average 65 inches in height to make that work. We need all the running cars to be close to the garage doors. You know, so it's... Um, it's interesting and it's fun. Um, but we can store, if I, if I do my job right, we can put 19 cars mm -hmm. back here. Mm -hmm. We have 41, right now we have 41, soon to be 42 cars. So the job will get even harder about how to get them all to fit in here. Is wow. that you who drives? You are the video driving movies yes. and the cars? Yes, but I'm not actually driving. They're pulling me oh. on the track. <laughs> You're steering. Yeah, I'm steering. Yes, I'm steering. It, as we move, well, so we'll have our big car move day in October. We'll close, and then right after that, we move the cars <coughs> based on what level they're going to be. Are they going to be in storage, the upper level, or the lower level of exhibits the following year? Mm -hmm. So we're not making that move in like February. We did that the first year. Like, mm -hmm. No, we're not doing this again. Mm -hmm. The moves are going to happen in October. So. They, we don't, the, for the cars that run, we do not drive them when we move them on that day because it's too, they are fussy and they take forever to get going. Maybe they decide they won't, don't want to start that day and we have to put the gas in and then pump it all out again mm -hmm. because we can't leave gas and the fire inspector says we may not have more than five gallons of gas in the building total. So all the gas has to get pumped back out again, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. So. When we change levels, I steer and the guys pull me with a tractor and a tow strap as we go around. Um, or if we're in the building, I don't have a picture of it, but we have there are um, dollies that go on each tire called mm -hmm. go jacks, and we can spin the cars any way we want once the cars are mm -hmm. on the go jacks. So it makes it a lot easier. So we have an audit committee at the 
museum that is an advisory group that helps us with anything automotive related. So they have contacts with other people. So if I need, for example, this is a real example, next year I need a 19 or 19, 1920 or 1930s RV for the exhibit that we're doing next year, I ask them, guys, you must know somebody who has one of these things. Um, they help us with our auto programming during the year. They dust the cars for us weekly. And then a small group of people, and some of them are here, are members of what we call the car guys. Uh, and the car guys come in twice a week and keep our running cars running. Um, and they do staff maintenance on the cars that are not currently running. So here they are um, working on um, our 1931 Ford <coughs> Model A Deluxe Phaeton. Uh, we have an adopted car program fund where people can make donations to the fund. And then when we reactivate a car, which we want to do one car every year, this year we're going to do two, the money gets pulled from that fund. So this is our... Um, Oldsmobile Autocrat, this was recently adopted by, not to be made running again, but just a monetary gift made to adopt a car in sort of support or in honor of this car for, by a couple from Connecticut who really enjoyed that particular car. So the car that the guys are currently working on is our 1925 Franklin. So when we're talking about which is the next car to reactivate in the list, um, the conversation inevitably goes like this. The guys say, Jennifer, we think we should do X car, and don't worry, it's going to be really easy. We know, you know, nothing's going to go wrong with this one. It's going to be a piece of cake, and it's going to be cheap. And I say, okay, sure. So this, in this case, the Franklin is air-cooled, so there's no radiator or water pump to give us trouble, and that usually is the source of difficulty in other cars. So they said, don't worry, Franklin's going to be easy, it'll be great. Well, then they got in part to find that the pistons had been modified incorrectly sometime in the past and that there was no re-modifying them, so we needed all new pistons. And guess what? There aren't very many makers of 1925 pistons in the United States. One place in California, they have to save up enough orders before they will run a series of pistons, and then there's only one place to modify them that's in Minnesota, and da da so here are all, here's the Franklin with the engine missing, and all of the parts lined up on the table right now while we are waiting for the machine. So we have the pistons now, and the machine shop has the engine, and they are working on getting everything ready to fit together. Um, and let's see what else I've got here. Mm. We do auto outreach as well. So we used to do four auto shows, take our cars to other auto shows per year. So we go to the Bay State Antique Auto Club show in June, which is held at the Endicott Estate in Dedham, and the Misslewood Concord de Elegance, which is at Endicott College in Beverly, the Boston Cup, which is in September. And then this was in October 2019. The Audrain Concord de Elegance is in Newport. It was a new show in 2019. Of course, it got canceled last year, and they do think it will happen this year. So this is the our Stutz Bearcat winning third place in the historic Newport class nice. in 2019. So you, you truck them, I guess. Yes, John Elmendorf, who's one of our volunteers here, has an enclosed auto trailer and Suburban. So the museum does not own that a trailer or a tow vehicle. So we rely on our volunteers to do that. And we do some auto programming, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. We have a, um, an annual auto show that happens every year in June. Next year will be our 50th anniversary of that show. Uh, we have done monthly this year and last year Gearhead Garage, what we call Gearhead Garage programs, where um, collection storage is open. It was actually very, it was nice because it was a COVID safe program. We could open the garage doors and people could mask and social distance, but walk through our collection storage area. We get a couple cars out in the parking lot, start them, and drive them around. So for the people who are really interested, I'm interested in the social history of the automobile. Not everyone wants to hear about that. For the people who want to hear about displacement and, and 
engines and brakes and things. They come to Gearhead Garage. And this is this all right, this is the Mercer at Gearhead Garage. That was just a couple weeks ago. We've got three of those programs out this year. Cocktails for cars happen September 12th. It's a, basically a small, very high-end car show with 30 cars. Um, and it's a fundraiser for that adopted car um, fund that I mentioned a little bit ago. And then just last weekend, we did our first Cars and Coffee, which is weekend morning from 8 to 10. Anyone can come and bring their car, uh, sponsored by Hagerty Insurance. And they provide coffee and donuts and whatnot. It's just a nice socializing opportunity. Is that going to be a regular? We, uh, it was a really big success. They expected 150 cars, and we had over 200 cars. Really? And then I was, I was, I didn't think we'd get 150 cars. Really? Where, where did they end up? Where were they parked? They were parked in our main parking lots. Mm -hmm. So since it's early in the morning, it wasn't inside. You know, our auto show was like inside the grounds on the lawn next to our special exhibitions gallery for two hours in the morning. It's not worth doing that, so we just parked them all in the parking lots. Mm -hmm. um, and then people could get a discounted admission to come in to the museum. Are they? When are they going in again? So they. So the Hagrid was really pleased with how it went. So they would like to investigate doing two per year. So doing one in May and one in August next year. So we hope that that will happen. Nice. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. People loved it. Mm -hmm. And it was just an easy drive in, drive out, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. not a lot of fuss. Yeah. So that's all I've got for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, we did. We got the first of all the um, Porsche clubs showed up in mass. So they brought I don't know how many Porsches, but we had um, all different kinds of sports cars. We had unrestored an unrestored uh, 50s. I don't remember what kind of car came in. Um, just like regular old wagon gears came. There was a um, Sinclair uh, like gasoline truck. It was, it's just a fun, you know, fun event. Yeah. There's a couple of stories that you had guy Ken Purdy on this. Yes. He wrote a book called Ken Purdy's Book of Automobiles. And I, when I was a little kid, I bought it. Mm -hmm. And I read it and you mentioned how the Duesenbergs are kind of lousy businessmen. Mm -hmm. He, um, they invented, according to the book, they invented the hydraulic brake system. Mm. But didn't have the sense to uh, patent it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. And so they, you know, they lost out on millions. Mm -hmm. And then, when Pierre Sarrow came out with their V12, they took it to the racetrack, and uh, they floored it, you know, pedal to the metal, and it was probably doing 100, 110 miles an hour, and they kept it up for 24 hours straight. Wow. And it would only slow down when they would refuel it. Mm -hmm. and as soon as the refueling was done, they they step on it. Mm -hmm. This is a test. Right. So after 24 hours, they stopped it, and then they tore the engine down, and they said it was in perfect shape. Wow. Which car was that? Uh, a V12 Pierce Arrow. Wow. Yeah. 